Welcome to you in the audience and those connecting remotely. Thank you for attending. I'm Bruce McFadden, director of the Thompson Earth Systems Institute, which is the host of this event. The Institute was established in 2018 to advance communication and public understanding of our Earth's natural systems in Florida and beyond. The concept of Earth systems includes the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the geosphere, and the biosphere, or more simply put, air, water, land, and life. All of these natural systems are interconnected, and when one changes, this has a cascading effect on the other systems as well. We will fulfill the Institute's mission by aggregating the Earth system research done at the University of Florida and elsewhere and disseminating these discoveries to our target audiences, including the scientists we serve, plus UF undergraduates, lifelong learners, policy and decision makers, and K-12 teachers and students throughout Florida. We encourage you to learn more about us. You can do so by visiting our website and following us on Facebook and Twitter with the handles at UF Earth Systems. We're also launching a new, a new publication, uh, a new newsletter, Earth to Florida, that aggregates the state's environmental news and offers, ex and offers expert insight from Florida researchers. And you can su subscribe to it um, with a URL on this slide. Lastly, if you're interested in collaborating with us, send us an email. Uh, at Earth Systems at Florida Museum, ufl.edu. Whoops. There we go. Events like this just don't happen. They take careful planning and preparation. I'd like to acknowledge our institute's team that has made this possible, including Jennifer Bauer, Rebecca Burton, Adania Fleming, and Sadie Mills, if you would please stand, the four of you. Thanks for everything you've done. With regard to sustainability, thanks to Sadie Mills for taking the lead to make this a certified Blue Level Sustainable event at University of Florida. I'd also like to acknowledge our partners for this panel, the UF Water Institute and Wendy Graham, and UF Bob, the UF Bob Graham Center for Public Policy and Service, and David Colburn. And last but not least, I'd like to thank our panel, whom you will meet in just a minute, including Cynthia Barnett, Lind, uh, Lisa Krimsky, Dale Laffinghouse, and Andrew Reich. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Cynthia Barnett. Cynthia is environmental journalist in residence at UF's College of Journalism and Communications, an environmental fellow at the Bob Graham Center for Public Service, where she works on environmental civics, ethics, and leadership. She is the author of three popular water books, including Rain, a Natural and Cultural History, long listed uh, for a national, that was long listed for a National Book Award. Her water and climate reporting appears in National Geographic, The Atlantic, The Los Angeles Times, and other publications. She is also the author of Mirage, Florida and the Vanishing Water of the Eastern U.S., and Blue Revolution, On Making America's Water Crisis, which describes a new water ethic for this nation. Please help me welcome Cynthia and the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here on a Friday afternoon. And um, I'm going to ask you to check out Mentimeter if you haven't already. It's a neat way to have the audience engage in a conversation so we could ask you something and um, you can all, we'll, we'll pull it up on the screen. If you go to, um, am I there yet? Yes. Is it www. So go to menti.com and then you'll put in the you'll put in the code on the screen and then we will it's not up there. <laughs> so
So um, you heard who I am, and my job is to introduce our three wonderful panelists and to um, get the conversation started. What we thought we should do is have each of the three panelists who have all traveled here to Gainesville to be with us to kind of give you an opening so that you'll hear sort of what their role is and how their um, work on Red Tide informs this discussion. In other words, what they're doing here. Ah, have you already started? Have they already started? So you can see on the first question what words come to mind when you think about Red Tide. I see death. See death right in the middle. Algae, smell, sadness coughing. Yeah, sadness is really, um, this is great. Upwelling. Who, who said upwelling? <laughs> who, Wendy Graham, did you say upwelling? <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll, will we keep this up while we're going along throughout the um, program? Yes. Okay. Okay. So we can come back and look at this and look at uh, the answers to other questions. So I am going to start by introducing our three panelists and then again we're going to ask them to come up and give you about 10 minutes or so on their, on their work. I think I'll start all the way at the end with Dale Laughinghouse. He's UF IFAS assistant professor and algae scientist. He is a broadly trained phycologist but I understand that Jack Payne calls him the algae slayer. So today we can just call him the algae slayer. Uh, Dr. Laughinghouse works with both basic and applied algal research from tropical to polar regions. Some of the current research in his lab focuses on diversity and toxic toxicity of cyanobacteria, environmental influence on macroalgae and microbial photoautotrophs, novel applied uses for algae, bioremediation, and the detection and effects of bioactive compounds. He's based in Fort Lauderdale, so thank you for being with us. I'm going to go ahead and introduce everyone, and then they will, um, they'll come up in the order in which I introduce them. Next on the panel is Lisa Krimsky. She's a water resources specialist with IFAS and Florida Sea Grant part of a team that leads and supports water resource extension education programs. Lisa's efforts are focused primarily in southeast Florida with a focus on water quality in coastal and estuarine ecosystems. Her programs help solve water resource issues that are critical to both economic development and environmental protection in Florida. And to my left, to your right, we have Andy Reich, who is scientific advisor to the chief of the Bureau of Environmental Health at the Florida Department of Health. For more than 10 years, he's led the department's efforts to address adverse health impacts from exposure to toxic algal blooms in freshwater and marine environments. His efforts have led to an integrated and collaborative approach to environmental health response in Florida with federal, state, and local partners, including, including NOAA, CDC, Army Corps, and the US EPA. So thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, Dale, I think I'll ask you to come up first, if, that's, if that sounds good. And um, after the panelists introduce themselves and their work to you, then I will start us off with some questions, but I hope that you all have excellent questions for the panel. Thank you. Yeah, I'm saving the world with a, what do you call it, with a turkey baster. Okay, hi. Yeah, so um, my name is Dale Laffinghouse. Um, I've been working with algae for about 17 years. Like I say, this here is Brazilian dermatology. Um, I'm from Brazil originally. So, um, and nobody laughed, it's terrible. But anyways, can you guys hear me? You guys can hear me? Okay, you can hear me. Like this? There's a volume button on the podium. Where, can you show me? There's a lot of buttons here. <laughs> I'm a psychologist, not an IT person, so. Oh yeah, and they're all, they're all black, so it looks the same thing. Okay, you guys, oh, this is better. 
Anyways, um, so I was asked to talk a bit about dinoflagellates uh, in general, like algae biology and ecology. Uh, okay, one thing, I speak fast. I will try to slow down. If you guys say they'll slow down, especially I get very excited. And um, I, okay, like this. I mean, but then you'll get the spit all over that yeah, I do. Okay. It's okay? Okay, good. So anyway, so good. Like I said, I'm Dale Laffinghouse. I've been working with algae for about 17 years. And I'm just going to talk a bit about uh, the biology ecology of, uh, of dinoflagellates, especially Karenia. And it should be very fast, especially I speak quickly. So again, so we're going to start talking about dinoflagellates a little bit. So, but, so my outline is what are dinoflagellates? Um, dinosaur and dino are two different, um, I'll let you guys, I don't want to go into Latin or Greek or whatever, but dino and dino are different, come from different um, backgrounds. So it's dinoflagellate and dinosaur, okay? Those are different things, um, if you care. So afterwards, I'll talk about Karenia brevis, which is a problem here, which we have a concern here. Then I'll talk about red tides, which is a type of harmful algal bloom, and then some causes of Karenia okay, blooms. So there's a problem first with, with an attitude with algae. So they call them harmful algal blooms. First thing, this is not a red tide behind there. That's a, uh, the view of my apartment building. I live in Fort Lauderdale, so that's the only kind of garden I have. Um, and that's a cyanobacterial bloom, and I've been doing a lot of work with that, and I've told my, my HOA area to not, to, to keep, whatever they're doing, to keep doing it, because I love it. And then that's Okeechobee, but anyways. So they call it harmful algal blooms. They call it pond scum. So I work with scum. I work with you know, the scum of the earth are my colleagues. So a, a frog spittle, which is that, al you know, all, not all of this is, uh, is marine. We're talking about from the fresh water. So that spittle is kind of like that macro algae you see that looks like little bubbles, right? Seaweeds. Um, there's a colleague of anyone uh, of, uh, in the Phycological Society that, um, that she's trying to say sea vegetables. It hasn't really caught on. Um, so green slime or pea soup, right? And this, does this, oh here, this is, um, which one is, is that the okay, yeah. green, oh right, okay, great. So what are dinoflagellates? So the eukaryotes. So first thing what I want to say is, we are talking about the dino red tide, that one. This is totally different than cyanobacteria, totally different than blue-greens, um, and the factors, physiology, ecology, evolution, is very different. For example, blue-greens are 3.5 billion years old, compared to these, which are about 500 million, it depends, you know, on the person, 250 million with, uh, with fossils, you know, four, uh, 500 million. We're talking about a three billion year difference of these organisms. And to group all these things, the same thing, to group all these things as they are controlled the same. For example, you are more closely related, me too, to a fungus than all the algae together, right? So we're in a uh, group called Epistacons. You guys remember uh, school, you know, Epistaconte, Metazoa. And so if any of you guys are vegetarians, do you guys eat fungi? You know, because it's also in the same group. So that's a question for, for you guys. So they're unicellular protists. They're called al alveolates. Um, and they motile. They're biflagellate. However, if you see it's under lipodium, so the idea by Lynn, Mar Lynn Margulis was to call them under lipodia because the, the, the flagellate is different. So that little tail has different genes. And, um, but then uh, I used to work in, at Smith College, and uh, we were talking like, OK, do you think it's going to catch on? And she goes, you, you all have to die first. To say that, you know, for the, you know, it means that if you guys knew Lynn Margulis or know of her, she's an interesting, was, well, she's, uh, she's passed away now, which is very interesting, was Carl Sagan's wife at one time. So anyway, so you see there's, they have this like tail or, the, or flagellum or endlipodia around, you know, like a, like a belt, and they have a little, you know, a little tail that goes there and lets them swim, OK? There's over, uh, and, and there's over 2,000 species. Like I said, the fossil record goes back to the Triassic, but some of the biogeochemical mar markers go back to the Cambrian. And I, I, the number, the 250, 500, is the, mean, is the mean between these ages. They have a complex life cycle, and, they, and many are mixotrophic. What does that mean? You guys know mixotrophic? Okay, so they can have light, and they can also eat other things, right? So, and these are just pictures of different ones, you know, different uh, genera, and it shows they're actually very pretty under the microscope. So some common dinoflagellate have genera. So it's um, red tide, you know, Karenia is not the only organism of the dinoflagellates that is, that blooms. Okay, okay, Peter, thank you. So there's things called Alexandrium, and this is a big problem, especially in the Baltic Sea. Uh, Goniolix, um, Karenia, Gymnodinium, Dinophysis, Serratium, uh, Chaptonella, and they're very pretty, actually. You see that? That's Serratium. They, they, you can find that in fresh water, too. But um, you see the beautiful little things. So, but Karenia brevis is what we're, we're talking about some today, right? And that's what we have. We have many species in, uh, off the Gulf in, in Florida and on, on, on my side, the East Coast as well. But um, the problems we've had, the concerns we've had is with Karenia, right? So it's a dinoflagellate. It's mixotrophic. It's a common hab former in um, harm, hab is harmful algal bloom, remember, in Gulf of Mexico. Um, I think you're going to comment about one of the 15, in the 1500s by the, um, 
the explorer that saw the same thing. So they, it's been here for thousands of years, for hundreds of years and probably thousands of years, okay? So it's naturally occurring here off, offshore in, uh, in Florida. So it, um, I'll let the others talk about human health and toxins talk, but it produces something called brevitoxin, which is a concern for human health and for animal health. And, well, we are animals, so animal including human health. Um, it's the most prevalent of 11 species in the genus and has several life stages. So if you see here again, it also has that kind of little, little um, girdle and a little, you see a little tail kind of like stuck up? So here, there's also a little tail there, okay? And it has this, it's um, a lot of lipid bodies and if, you, if you're interested in biology and ecology and morphology, you can talk later, I don't wanna bore you guys. But um, there's, it has a complex life cycle, okay? Or not so complex, but it has a life cycle. So it forms, you know, like for example, it forms cysts, as you see. And, um, and then uh, there will be an environmental trigger. Uh, if we knew the answer to that, we would, be a lot, we would know a lot more. An environmental trigger that makes it grow, right? And then it gets to a point, so these are asexual, and then it grows until a vegetative cell. And for some reason, environmental trigger, it'll become sexual, form zygotes, and then go back in the uh, cyst again. Okay, so remember, I'm gonna talk about cysting and sex, so it's cysts. So again, so what is a harmful algal bloom in relation to dinoflagellates? So you see these, these different, um, the red tides, you see the red tide, but it can be green, yellow, or brown. Again, it depends on the pigments, so it depends on the color of these organisms, right? Um, it's, they're found worldwide, uh, both marine and estuarine and freshwater blooms. Uh, in this case, in some cases, some blooms are, have toxic production. Uh, and then with this one, where we're talking about perennial, we're talking about fish kills, contaminated shellfish, respiratory distress, and I know the other panelists will talk about this um, in, in economics and um, in health. But perennia brevis, so how does it happen? So this is it. So it's a natural occurring bloom. So, so, um, so let's see how I'm say. So the, um, the dust, the, 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 okay, go back. So I'm trying to see where to begin. So this, the, um, um, the Gulf, of, uh, Gulf of Mexico offshore is very, is oligotrophic. So it's nutrient poor. Right, and in iron, it needs iron. It's one, it was one of the um, one of the um, um, elements it needs. So we have, in certain times of the year, uh, we have the Saharan desert dust that comes over. You see, it makes beautiful, beautiful night skies. Right when it's kind of red at night, comes over. And then last year we had a very bad, uh, very, very, very bad, um, or or good if you like the red skies. Um, and then it causes a bloom of trichodesmium. Trichodesmium means chain of hair. Right. So and so that's trichodesmium. This beautiful little thing down here. Um, and so, and that's able to fix nitrogen. It's a cyanobacterium. However, do you see, usually cyanobacteria that are considered fixing nitrogen, okay, they have a specialized cell. These don't have specialized cells, so they fix nitrogen badly. So they, it's kind of the cookie monster eating, right? So the crumbs go down. And so those crumbs are available for other organisms, right? Uh, and also due to upwelling or due to benthic, you know, the benthos changing, you have the cysts that come from the bottom and can go up in the water, right? And so these can grow because the nutrients are there. Then the ocean currents will transport, and that can transport all around the Gulf and also can, can transport on our coast. Um, with the increase, so one of the problems, one of the triggers for them is, considered, is, is, increased, is increased temperature, which we are seeing in the, in the world. And also what the uh, Karenia is able to do is using many forms of nitrogen and phosphorus. So what is upwelling? I saw somebody saw it. It's fine. You know, it's just um, um, you know we have the surface winds that, that push the water, and then the bottom uh, the bottom current, the bottom um, uh, waters can go up, right? I'm just just very that's just uh, summarizing it. Got it? So, but like I said, we said we have upwelling, and I said currents, right? So here, so you see around here. I mean, off, there's a shelf. So often this shelf here is where the the, the bloom forms because it's, the dust comes over, right? And I have one minute left, so I better hurry up. So, um, so this is just to show the loop current. I, I think you guys probably know this, but it's just to give you guys a little overview. Um, and now I'm ending. So, but um, what are the sources of nutrients? So they're very good sources of nutrients. So the best, this is from Ohio. So the best thing you see, look at this. It's offshore small bloom, coastal small bloom, large bloom, coastal largest bloom, estuarine small bloom, estuarine large bloom, largest bloom. If you see what are the main contributing nutrients, you see it's zooplankton excretion, it's dead fish, the only place that we see once any part of freshwater it flo river flux was in 2005 in her work. That was only in small blooms. So most of the blooms what they use are natural, are um, you know, decaying fish and also uh, you know, poop from, from zooplankton and everything. But uh, we can talk about this a bit later. So then summarizing it, the, this is a nice little confusing, but um, I took it offline. So it's more or less, I told you, the iron. The iron, will, you know, the, the, the dust comes over, the iron, is, the iron is fixed. You want to come in, you're going to throw me off. 
<laughs> I'm on my last slide, don't worry. Um, so, the, like I said, the saline dust, dust comes over, it, the iron stimulates trigodesmine bloom, that makes new nitrogen. So that's what I'm showing you on the right, correct? And that can go to Karenia. But also, uh, copepods will eat, they will poop, that's another form of, uh, of, um, of, 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 uh, of nutrients. The benthic flux, so the stuff that comes from the bottom that goes up, that's another form of nutrients. And then, of course, um, the dead fish has decayed, that's another form of nutrients. Okay? So those are the forms of nutrients it does. So then now, thank you. Um, so I'm just picturing my lab and my contact if you want to talk to me anytime. Hello, can you all hear me? Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Krimsky. I'm a Regional Water Resources Extension Agent. Um, first caveat, I've been asked to talk about economics of red tide. I am not an economist. My job as an extension agent is to synthesize the scientific-based research that's done and to bring it into sort of a digestible format so that we can have real science-based solutions to these problems, red tide being the one we're talking about today. So this uh, chart that I'm going to show you right now, this image, it comes from a recent publication of harmful algal blooms. And what this is showing is sort of the overall national um, trend of economic impacts of harmful algal blooms throughout the United States. And so what I want you to take away from this is that Florida has been studied a lot because the economic intensity of algal blooms in the state of Florida, mostly because of red tide, is really large. The uh, size of the circles is kind of the economic impact associated with these harmful algal blooms. And you can see that we've had upwards of $100 million worth of economic impact in the state of Florida due to these red tides. The economic impact analyses that have been done can be seen in a variety of different sectors. You have the cleanup costs. We are all familiar with those pictures of dead fish and other marine organisms washed up on the beaches and our shorelines. We have to clean those up and there's an impact to that. Loss of tourism and, bus and local businesses. The impact to fisheries, both recreational and commercial. Human health costs and coastal property values. What's not really quantified in this is the cost to um, management and monitoring, both over the long term, but also in the emergency funding that we have when a red tide has been seen, has been triggered, and we know that we have to monitor it um, more. The cost to communicating with the public and our resource managers. So what are the outreach and communication costs associated with that? Those are additional economic benefits that really aren't quantified in the literature. So I'm going to talk about that first sector, and that being the cleanup costs. Many of our uh, local counties and municipalities actually have red tide cleanup costs built into their annual budget. Red tides are seen almost annually in the Gulf of Mexico, and so they account for this in the budget. And these can range anywhere from about $250,000 on a, you know, a relatively small scale to over millions of dollars, depending on the intensity of the bloom. Sarasota County this year alone had more than 1,800 tons of dead marine um, life that it had to clean up and account for. And so um, we, because of the massive amount of dead marine life associated with the 2017-2018 red tide, there actually was an emergency declaration fund for $14.5 million. Um, some caveats with the numbers that I'm going to be showing you is that much of the 2017-2018 economic impact hasn't been analyzed yet. So the numbers I'm presenting, with few exceptions, come from different bloom years, different geographic scales, um, and so they really can't be compared to one another. It's just to kind of show you the overarching trends. Human health impacts, so it's a harmful algal bloom because of this brevitoxin that Dale talked about. The brevitoxin um, causes upper respiratory issues with humans. I kind of leave over here. Andy's going to be talking about that a whole lot more. But essentially, um, especially people with asthma can have some serious upper respiratory problems associated with it. There can be gastrointestinal illness associated with uh, consumption of contaminated shellfish. And so the costs associated with this in southwest Florida due to going to the emergency room, clinics, doctors, loss of um, 
not going to work that day has been estimated to be about a million dollars. Real estate values. So real estate can be impacted in a number of ways. In sort of the short immediate term, you can have um, the immediate loss of sales. Sanibel and Captiva Chamber of Commerce for this year alone did an economic survey to try and evaluate what the 2017-2018 economic impacts were to their local communities. And they uh, witnessed a real-time loss of about nearly $4 million in lost sales. So these were mostly from homes that were in contract and people walked away from them because of the red tide. Um, fortunately for the real estate community in those areas is that those impacts tend to be really short-lived. And as soon as the uh, red tide and the associated fish kills are over, the uh, real estate industry bounces back pretty quickly. And in 2015, Florida Realtors Association was interested in really quantifying the impact of water quality on waterfront homes and residential properties. They looked mostly at um, Lee County on the west coast and Martin County on the east coast. And their sort of criteria for water quality was water clarity. And what they found on the west coast was that they didn't see a negative decline in property values associated with water quality. What they did see was that the clearer the water, the higher the property values were. This is in contrast to the East Coast, where they actually saw declines associated with property value. Impact to local businesses. So this can be seen at the local level, where residents who live there year-round maybe will choose to go to a different re uh, restaurant, let's say. They don't want to be dining on a waterfront restaurant if there's a red tide in the area, and they'll choose to go to another restaurant or loss of local business from people not coming to the area and not visiting the area. So this has been estimated to be about $51 million in restaurant and hotel sectors. Um, Sanibel and Captiva, again, their Chamber of Commerce survey saw that retail was down about 31% over one year. This is consistent with another study that was done by Adams and Larkin in the Destin area that also saw about 27 to 30 percent decline in business associated uh, specifically with red tides. Tourism and lodging. So these are the people who are choosing to either end their vacations early or simply not to come at all because of the red tides. And this also comes very from that specific sector of the Sanibel and Captiva for the, this most recent bloom year. They saw a 78% cancellation rate and $8 million in lost revenue. There is a huge caveat associated with this in that the red tide um, economic impacts for this area cannot be separated from the economic impacts associated with the Lake Okeechobee discharges and the blue-green algae blooms. You'll notice that this picture that I'm showing up, the discoloration of the water, this is actually freshwater discharge from Lake Okeechobee, not red tide. So for this year alone, 27, 2018, it's going to be really hard to kind of separate and tease out those economic impacts from the two water quality algal bloom issues that we saw. I'm going to finish it up in talking about fisheries. The most heavily um, impacted fishery is our shellfish aquaculture fishery. So we have shellfish aquaculture in south, uh, southwest Florida. We aquaculture four uh, shellfish species. And you can see because shellfish filter out, they feed by filtering out the water, um, they take in those uh, red tide algae. And so the harvesting has to be closed by the Florida Department of Agriculture. And you can see that these are over the past five years how many days the shellfish harvesting areas were closed. And so in Charlotte County in 2018, it was essentially closed the entire year. And you can imagine the impact to the industry, especially unlike our other agricultural sectors, the aquaculture industry does not have any insurance. Oop. And this was quantified in 2015, 2016 to be about $3 million loss to the industry. I'm focusing here on Florida stone crab because we saw a lot about Florida stone crab in the media. What's important to note, uh, 2018 was actually on record to be the lowest stone crab harvest rate ever. In the history of landings, it's the lowest. Um, However, if you can see from this graph, basically it cannot be attributed to red tide. 
This is just low population due to overharvesting. The red tide makes it a less resilient population. And um, because it's also a luxury item, contrary to the low landings, we also had the highest values. So economics are not always a predictor to um, how well an industry is doing. What we do know from talking to the commercial fishermen in the area is that we're losing the small and medium-sized fishermen in the area. They simply cannot compete with the larger um, commercial fish houses, and so we're losing people from that industry. And the last one I want to talk about is the nectin. This is anything that swims in the water column. So we're talking about fish, crabs, shrimp, in Tampa Bay specifically. And again, for 2017, 2018, despite there being a red tide, we actually had healthy fish stocks. If you look at it from a species to species level, there were some impacts. And so those of you who are recreational fishermen, you might know that snook is closed, uh, spotted sea trout is closed, red drum is closed. But overall, populations are good and are not impacted by red tide. So even though you see all those crazy pictures of fish uh, washed up, it's extremely resilient to red tide. Um, but despite that, we do expect to see recreational and uh, charter uh, fisher impacts to be seen due to these species by species closures. The other thing that's of note is with the stone crabs and all of these fish species is that the fish and the, the crabs that are most impacted are those younger ones. And so for fisheries, it's oftentimes hard to quantify because the expected impact is going to be seen two to three years after an event when you're no longer seeing the large adults because the juveniles or the young of year didn't survive as a result of those red tides. So again, um, oh, okay, and I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my God, let's get rid of that. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I'm Andy Reich. I'm in Florida Department of Health, and I work in the Bureau of Environmental Health. I have about a year and a half to go before I'm out of, the, of uh, my working life, and I can start enjoying other things like going to the beach and kayaking and things like that. But, so the department right now is having me mentor a number of other people working in harmful algal blooms. When I started this um, career in harmful algal blooms, this is about 20 years ago, um, and a lot has happened. So since that time, you know, algae blooms have become the thing that I work on these days. In the beginning, it really wasn't, but it really has a tremendous impact in Florida. Thank you. It's a tremendous impact in Florida. So how many people here grew up or live within 20 miles of the coast? Quite a bit. How many people here like to go to one of the... Um, coastlines to um, recreate and have fun. Wow, see that's pretty much almost everybody. And then you can see why red tide and blue-green algae is a really important topic in the state of Florida. You know, Florida really is driven by our tourist um, uh, capabilities, you know, why people come here. And it's not just tourists that come here from outside the state. We are also tourists. So there's folks who live in Tampa that may go down to the Florida Keys. There may be someone in Miami that goes up to Seaside in the Panhandle. It's very important to the economy of Florida to have healthy ecosystems and especially healthy beaches. And one of the things that they talk about when they go to the beach is, you know, is it healthy for me? You know, if there's a red tide or a blue-green algae bloom, they want to know. You know, should I bring my two-year-old child to the beach during that time? Should I bring my mom who just is recovering from um, cancer treatment to the beach? So it's a really important topic. And even though you see thousands and thousands of dead fish on the beach, really the thing that drives a lot of these concerns is the public health. And for us in public health, it's, we just don't, we're not just concerned about one type of person. We're concerned about people who are healthy, maybe they're lifeguards. They're concerned about people who maybe are not that healthy, maybe they're older, maybe they have some kind of illness. So in public health, we really are out to protect the most sensitive populations in those communities. 
And in Florida, a lot of those communities live in or near um, seasides, and that's where the red tide is a real impact. Um, these two pictures behind me, one where it says Karenia Brevis Red Tide, that um, is, a, um, is a graphic that shows red tide um, during um, August of uh, 2018, and that is something that's put out by our wonderful Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. They have a research institute in St. Pete, and it does a tremendous job. They are the experts in red tide in Florida for um, the ecological issues. On the right tide side is Everyone, anyone recognize what that is? Lake Okeechobee. That's been in the news a lot. And that is um, a, um, a satellite image of chlorophyll that relates to blue-green algae. And that was done in, uh, in July of 2018. And I'm always amazed that you can have these satellites in space taking pictures of these single-celled organisms in, in, uh, in Florida. And it, actually, the, the way we can do that is even getting better as we are getting um, greater and greater um, detail of the satellite images. This is a picture of Carinia Brevis red tide, and this is a kind of interesting. So, you know, up until maybe three years ago, we hardly had any pictures of Florida red tide, excuse me, of Carinia Brevis red tide, it's because um, it just, it's not as, I'd say, photogenic as blue-green algae is. So only with the use of um, of drones are we really now getting really good pictures of it. And it's not always red, it's not all brown, it can be, it can be um, present um, visually, but sometimes it's there and you don't even know it. This of course is a picture of uh, the blue-green algae, and I always say they're really photogenic and they really make the papers, usually the front page, very often. So because they are very obvious, right, they're bright green, you know, you can walk right up to them and take a picture. You don't have to be offshore, you know, 20 miles to take a picture of them. They usually smell pretty nasty, so you can find them easily. And um, they make headlines. People see this on the front page of their local newspaper, or they are on a video that, um, and a TV. They're very impressive. But in terms of public health, that's actually a good thing. Because, you know, you, sh you generally can see where these blue-green algae blooms are. And it gives you, as a resident, as someone in Florida, an opportunity to make your own decisions whether you should be in that water or not. So in Florida, the Department of Health does things a little differently than some of the other states does. We don't really rely on fancy tests to tell people to stay out of water. So if you wanted to base your decisions on... on pure science, you would grab a sample on Monday, right? Do you, well, let's say Bloom is reported to you on Monday. DEP goes and samples the water on Tuesday. They send it to the lab. It gets to the lab on Wednesday. It takes them until Thursday to do the analysis and get it back. Do you really want to wait that long for the Department of Health to make a, a statement saying you shouldn't be in that water? I always say you don't need a $1,000 lab test to tell you what's really right in front of you. And that's what we do. We don't rely on those you know, toxin tests for cyanobacteria. With a red tide, we don't have to tell people to, um, you know, that we have to wait to get test results. If you go to the beach during a time when there's a red tide around and you're starting to cough, and if you're a healthy guy, you know, you're a lifeguard, you may just get what we call the red tide tickle. It bothers you a little bit and it's, you, you can deal with it. But if you have asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, something like that, you may want to reconsider being at the beach any, for any length of time. Again, there's a lot of other things you can do in Florida that are really fun. You don't have to be on a beach, just like you don't have to be you know, outside in the pouring rain. You know, if, it's, if it's not to your liking or you're having an effect, go somewhere else. Um, you know, um, and that's what we tell people. You know, don't, don't risk it. If you have underlying lung disease and you're starting to get effects on a red tide, you know, get up. And if you go inside in air conditioning, the symptoms generally go away. If you live on the beach, if you're lucky enough, you know, close the windows, run the air conditioning, it's usually much better. There's some more pictures of these, you know, beautiful photogenic cyanobacteria. Again, they're very easy to find and they, um, they take great pictures. So in, in the Department of Health, we really had a campaign that doesn't just focus on the red tide or the blue-green algae. There's other things in water that you need to know about. So 
But we've developed a campaign to swim it, meaning you know, swim with the buddy, right? You can drown in, in water too, so you know, swim it. If the water is clean, there's no blue green algae, and there's red tide, go ahead, enjoy it, but don't go swimming alone. Go, go swimming with a, with a buddy. Sure it. If you have a cut on your skin, you know, if your immune system is compromised, um, you really should not go in the water. People have had this notion that if you have a, like a wound, you should go into salt water and rinse it out. Well, that's not a good idea. We have these organisms called Vibrio bacteria in the water. It is not, um, it, it, these, are, these are naturally occurring organisms, and, um, but they're natural organisms all over the, um, the, the um, marine environment, so it's not due to pollution, but you really shouldn't be in the water. And people die of that. Blue-green algae, if you see blue-green algae, dodge it. Don't go swimming if you see these, these algae blooms. You know, try to go somewhere different. Um, one thing is interesting is that, you know, in terms of, and this is some other material that we have, we, um, you know, uh, Lisa had talked about the seafood industry. We have not had one single case of illness from someone eating an oyster that was contaminated by red tide toxins in the commercial field. So if you go to the seafood uh, restaurant, have your oysters. I mean, there's some other issues with oysters, but not related to red tide. You know, okay, um, right? I mean, there's Vibrio in there. So if you have um, underlying illness like um, liver disease, it's up to you, but I wouldn't be eating those things. Um, I eat them now. I'm, you know, a healthy guy. You know, I'm getting older, but not, uh, not that old yet. You know, give me a year or two, and then I will be. Um, but, you know, you, you have to make your own choices. But, you know, if there's a red tide out there, make sure that you're not out there harvesting oysters recreationally and don't know what's going on. You really need to know where those things are. So be careful when you recreate, um, recreationally shellfish. Um, go enjoy the seafood in a restaurant. It's safe. Um, and just be aware of what's going on. You can go to our website. There's a lot of really good information out there. Um, there's also information on the FWC website if you want to know a little bit more about the red tide organisms. You can go to the DEP website if you want to know about cyanobacteria, and those are agencies are responsible to really lead the state in those two um, types of blooms. And you can contact me if you uh, have any additional um, requests for information. I'd be more than happy to talk to you. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. I, I am going to start with a few questions that I have to admit I still have, even after listening to the three presentations. And then I hope that you have some great questions from the audience. And Sadie, I wonder, is there another Mentimeter poll you could pull up? And we'll just see, um, while I'm asking some questions, we can see what you guys are thinking about. So, as Dale mentioned, I brought a quote from the Spanish conquistador Cabeza de Vaca, and I, I've always loved this quote because I find it lyrical. I found that he wrote about harmful algae in a pretty lyrical way. Um, he noted in the 16th century that the native people marked the seasons based on the times when the fruit comes to measure and when the fish die and when the stars appear, in the observance of which they're very skilled and well-practiced. So we often are reminded of the Spanish, and we're reminded that these are naturally occurring. Um, but what I didn't hear, so we know they're not new, but I think what people want to know are, are they getting worse? And Dale, um, I wonder if I should start with Dale, or if, it, if everyone would like to tackle that. You, you, have, you did a presentation on the slide for okay. the time of that one. Um, we, at this point, we don't actually have the capabilities of determining whether red tides are getting worse. We know that the 2017, 2018 red tides were the fifth longest since we've been recording them, um, since about the mid 19, you know, 1950s or so. Um, we're unable to tell kind of the intensity or classify whether it's worse because 
the way that they've been monitored has not been consistent over time. So we're fortunate enough in that we're monitoring much more frequently now. We have a lot more tools um, available to us now. So you can't directly compare how red tide blooms are now compared to those um, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, even 20 years ago, because our monitoring programs have been so variable. So the only thing that we can say is that it's been, um, it is the fifth lo um, longest bloom that we've had in recorded history. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Do you want to add to that? Well, I just, uh, and this, uh, with what everything that Lisa said, it shows the importance of monitoring and putting um, dollars into monitoring. So with, like I said, without these new techniques, these te new techniques would not be, would not exist without more money into monitoring, more money into research. And the only way we can foresee or understand if these are worse or if these are okay or what, what not is putting money into uh, monitoring and so, uh, to understand what's going on and to under in everything. So this is, the, and this is a problem that we have in, in science is that monitoring is where money is going away. So, and that's a part of the, uh, but also we're getting this new technology, which is wonderful, but that's, that's one thing that I want to make sure uh, to point out with that. Andy, did you have something to add to that one? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll ask you a follow-up question, or a qu another question I had is, is somewhat related, Dale, to what you're saying about monitoring. So um, I was in, I've been in Tallahassee for the past few days, and last night, the Florida Senate passed a bill, it's Senate Bill 1552, to provide funding to, quote, develop prevention, control, and mitigation technologies for red tide algae. So I had the question, is this something that can be controlled? Yeah, I've answered that question. And maybe you could answer it in the context, too, of monitoring. So obviously there are, there are great needs that we have for, for science. So I guess maybe you could talk about what we need and whether, you know, whether control is possible, is something we should be hoping for. I don't like the word control because we can't control nature. Um, the word manage might be easier, which means we deal with it as well. So in relation to you about the control, uh, if we can control the dust coming over from Sahara with the iron, if we control the deposition in the water, if we control the trichodesmium blooming, fixing nitrogen, adding that ni making that nitrogen available, can we control the upwelling, can we control the loop current? You know, but with monitoring money, we can understand what's going on. Um, and as you saw with um, some work from, um, from Dr. Heil, is that she showed, even if, we're, for example, we, we can't, because it happens offshore, and then it's brought in. You know, that we can't control. And even if, even if the data, you know, if, the, if we have nutrients going in the water, which we do, and we should decrease, uh, decrease uh, you know, this is long-term decrease in nutrients. However, I, like I showed you, they're very good at scavenging other nutrients. So it doesn't mean they're gonna go away. It just means they're gonna get, grab something else, right? Um, and so, again, but again, the control or manage and all this, this is something that, let me go back, also control methods. There are no, I think there's only, there's no aquatic herbicide registered for marine use, right? So a lot of people come to me and say, what can I, what can I throw on it? Um, well, I say that label rate legally, I can't tell you, you can't do anything, right? Because we can't. There is one uh, a sodium, uh, a, a, a peroxide, I think it's um, a granule, I don't know, if it's, I can't remember which one it is, that is registered for estuarine use, okay? So this goes again that you have something that, that, that's, that's extremely different. Um, so I guess, for, again, like I said, uh, like California Coast has something called sea halves. I think we have sea halves uh, coming in here, some modeling, understanding demoic acid, um, the fate that Rafael Cudella and Clarissa Anderson do. So again, they get the money from, and that money is being invested into, into, mon into monitoring, into, into modeling. But um, we, like I said, we do have a long, uh, a long history of data, which we can mine from, to do these new technologies. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Did you want to add anything to that, Andy? Sure, when you talk about control and mitigation to public health, we're not necessarily talking about what we do ecologically. It's really what, you know, how can we reduce people's exposures to the toxins that are associated with, with the bloom. So with the Carini Brevis Red Tide, the work that we've done in the past has really shown that these uh, um, brevet toxins can be associated with salt spray and then get blown onshore with the winds. That is a that's good information to have. So 
we can tell people who are sensitive that if there's an onshore breeze, you probably should stay off the beach. Well, onshore breezes generally happen when? I windsurf, so I know the winds all the time. So it's in the afternoon, right? And in the mornings, a lot of times, it's much calmer. The winds, are, if it's winds, it's usually blowing from the shoreline off. So we can make those recommendations to people. So we're mitigating public health effects by understanding a little bit more about how these toxins move around. We can tell people, if you like to go fishing, you know, um, you can probably eat the fish because the, the toxins do not accumulate in the fillets. So, but don't eat the whole fish. Don't make fish soup with the head. Just eat the fillets. You know, if you wash it and you can eat it. But generally tell people, you know what? Maybe go fishing somewhere else. That's in something knowing about the toxins, where they accumulate, and giving people um, good common sense advice that they can kind of understand and act on it. Those to us with public health is, is the messages are important because um, we can't be with someone all the time. Sometimes mitigation is really expensive to try to control it, but if you understand it a little bit better, and that takes money too, right? We have to know how the toxins get transported in the air, but that's really important to us. So we're trying to give tools to people when they go out to understand you know, who may be more sensitive and what they can do to limit their exposure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this, uh, this Mentimeter was interesting that 13 people said they didn't understand the difference between uh, the two types of algae we're talking about, but I think that was before they heard from Dale maybe. So I think you, you really helped people understand the differences when you talked about evolution, but I think what is still, um, I think something we need to talk about a little bit more is that slide you had with the extent to which the blue-green algae aggravates red tide when red, red tide comes ashore. And, another, and, and the other part of that, um, which, which has been of great interest all over Florida and, and in, in the debates about all of this, is if you could talk about the extent to which uh, fertilizer, you know, whoever it's applied by, us Floridians or farmers, could you talk a little bit more about um, you know, how we impact red tide, if at all? And I know you had a little bit about the Caloosahatchee, right, on that, on that big graphic, but I think it deserves a little bit more. I'd like you um, to yeah. just have a, more of an idea. Let's okay. see. You can get it? Yeah. Because that'll give you more to know what this. But again, uh, your questions are wonderful, and there are a lot of things that, again, that we are like, I don't, we don't know. We don't have the data, right? So I can't, yes, so nutrients do, okay, let me just go back to that, that one, uh, the next one. Okay, so let's go back. This, is, this was about, you know, sources of nutrients for Karenia, for red tide, um, for Karenia bread this year. So, Karenia, like I said, Karenia starts offshore, right, and then it comes near shore, correct? Uh, with a loop current and, the, and, and everything. So, but if you look at here, let me grab this here, um, make it better. So we're talking about, so look, you see, offshore, small bloom, small bloom was 10 to the fifth cells. Um, you have coastal bloom and estuarine. This is when it's coming towards us. And then you have, the, so this, is the, this means this phosphorus is that color nitrogen. And this is the budget that we use up to 100%. So you're looking at always, so what do they use, what, what fulfills, what, where do the nutrients come that fulfill their nitrogen and phosphorus budget? They need those to grow, right? They're food. So if you're looking offshore, you're seeing just grazing, nitrification, you know, the excretion, um, you're looking at the trichodesmian fixation, regenerate, you know, decay. You're seeing that's an offshore, that's, what, that's where it starts, right? Coastal, um, on the small blooms, still, all that, there's nothing has to do, you look at here the, the hour flux in 2005. That's almost nothing in their budget. This is all what's contributing to their growth to the nitrogen phosphorus. And when you get to, okay, so that's a small, that's a small bloom. On the largest bloom, you see, it's still, is it the, the trichodens fixation and that. So still we don't see that influence at 100% of their growth or a large percent which is caused by, only by us, right? Now you're seeing here, yes, in the estuarine areas, we may have, we, some data indicate that yes, there is an influence, however, you see, even if we didn't have the, the estuarine and the influence from the, from the fresh water, from these nutrients, or from our, still, 100% of the nitrogen and phosphorus can also be, they can use excre they can get excretion from zooplankton, 
and, and perennial grazing and, and everything. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, go ahead. How is trichodesmia the fuel? Where does it get its food? Because uh, it's the food for the red tide for a year now. Correct. Correct. So, so um, trichodesmia is there and it's the iron that, that triggers it because there's not enough iron in the water, in the, in the water off there. It's very, it's very iron limited. Trichodesmium is a nitrogen fixer, mm -hmm. meaning it can take the nitrogen in, in the atmosphere, our air pollution, and use it to it feed. Use no. No, no. And so, and that's where a lot of cyanum do that, right? Because they're phosphorus limited. And then nitrogen limited. So, es marine waters are nitrogen limited. Fresh waters are phosphorus limited, except for Florida. We have a lot of phosphorus. Um, that's why you have beautiful, beautiful blue green blooms everywhere. It's beautiful. Um, and so this uh, it's called it's called job security, right? Um, so I mean, if you guys want to poop and everything out there, it's wonderful because it just keeps moving. But anyways, what I'm trying to say is that um, that yes, you're right. And then like with trichodesmine, like I said, it doesn't have that heterocyte, which some um, cyanobacteria have that form the a specialized cell with a wall that uses fixation nitrogen, which can keep it in very well. Um, uh, so it fixes, like I said, like a cookie monster. It doesn't fix it very well because it doesn't have where to compart compartmentalize it. And like, like Lisa said, it's getting from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm, uh, I'm just not as technical as these guys, you know. I mean, I, uh, I'm a health person that dabbles in some of the ecological stuff. But I just want to go over a little bit. So Corinia brevis red tide is a marine organism. I mean, it's adapted to the, to the marine side of things. Cyanobacteria is really a freshwater issue. So it sometimes spills out into the marine environment, but it really is a, is a freshwater organism. Corinia brevis is, is one sp species. Cyanobacteria, there's a bunch of different ones here. So sometimes, um, you know, it could be microcystis, and other times it could be anabina, the cylindra spamopsis. So that's one of the differences. Another difference between the two, and you know, and they happen together. So people getting it all mixed up and, and you know, the blue-green algae gets into the marine environment and it's just, it's, it was a big mess last year. Also, you know, Corinia brevis has a very demonstrated ability to get into the air. So when it gets into the air, it gets associated with these marine salt particles that get blown on shore. So that's why that respiratory irritation happens. That's why the, some of the, you know, the real root of exposure that we are concerned about is that aerosols. You know, blue-green algae, the toxins are much harder to get in the, in the air. Um, we, you know, they come in at very low concentrations. There's been some recent studies that said they found these things in the air, and it may be, but that science is not in. That science has shown, you know, that it was in the air even really far away from where these blooms were, so that, that um, hasn't really been decided. So that's another big thing. You know, cyanobacteria um, have been known to re be really toxic to animals. I mean, we know that at some level they are toxic. So if, um, you know, a cow drinks water that has a lot of cyanobacteria in it, they can die. We've had reports of dog deaths. You know, if, um, you, know if you have a Labrador retriever, you, you know that the second best thing they want to do after eating is go into the water, right? They, they do that and they go into water and they don't care if it's nasty and full of blue green algae and we've had dog deaths. The hard part for public health is for both red tide and for these blue-green algae, at what level is it a concern um, for chronic exposure? And we really don't have a lot of data on that yet. Um, we know what happens when you eat, you, you expose to a lot of it. Let's say you were drinking raw water, you know, that would be an issue. You shouldn't be ever drinking raw water. I mean, that's something that people do in other countries, you know, they're not as well off. But, but in the U.S., especially in Florida, we have a really good public drinking water system. So don't do that. So um, those are some of the differences between the blue-greens and the uh, cyanos. I mean, in the red tide. Can I adjust the fertilizer? Yes. yes. I, I want to get to the audience. So. Oh, okay. Yes, but go ahead quickly. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to address the fertilizer portion of that question. Um, and I think it's important to note, and, you know, we talked about the difference between red tide and blue-green. These are just two of the 50-plus harmful algal species that we have in the state of Florida. The state of Florida has a nutrient problem. And while that may not be the trigger for red tide, fertilizers and other human sources of nutrients are a trigger for dozens of other harmful algal species. So I think it's a, a matter of sort of 
making sure that we are addressing the solution in reducing our sources of nutrients, but also recognizing that every different species and every different bloom is going to have its own tailored geographic and species specific solution. Thank you, Lisa. I really want to get to the audience questions now. I hope that some of you have some good questions. And Becca, were there any from the online? Okay, we can see there. And does anyone have a question in the audience who wants to start? Yes, several. Okay, I'm going to start right here. Uh, I think this is addressed to Dale. Dale, your, your variation in, uh, in the uh, upwelling related to the Gulf Stream. If the Gulf Stream is going to be affected by global warming, is it going to affect the amount of water that sweeps around South Florida? That's a great question, and when you're answering that, if you could talk about the, the warming, too, because you mentioned the heat of the Gulf of Mexico and how that can have an impact on the red tide. So maybe in answering that question, you could talk about the fingerprint of climate change. Um, okay. so, so, uh, can you guys hear me? So you're let me just, no, okay. So let me just compartmentalize the, the question that if I understood correctly. So one part you want to understand, your question is that um, to understand the effects of climate change on the current, right? So, yeah, so data do indicate that the changing climates do affect currents, right? However, we don't know, at least I haven't seen, maybe I haven't read, exactly how it will change, right? And this has to go again with, with understanding and monitoring what's happening. So yes, so if there is a change in the current, then that means the pushing of the organisms will be different, right? And so again, that goes, do we mean it, do, what we do? Yes, so we do have an effect on the environment. So even, so that is a human effect on the environment and that can change because it could be that it doesn't go towards the coast. It could be that it goes around. And with heating of the waters, you have a dip, the, the, the stratification changes and the benthic flux changes everything. So that will, so heating, but climate change and heating will change the way the water rea reacts. I'm not an oceanographer, so I, I'm, I'm trying to give you the, the, the general way. But so, the, so, so did I answer your question? Um, okay, now I can't tell you how it's, what's going to happen, right? And I would love somebody to actually tell you, but I can't tell you what's going to happen. I'm not sure if the data are there to show exactly how it's going to change, right? It's kind of like, you know, hurricanes. We, we predict, 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 do we, it always, it changes, right? And a current can move it, right? So it's the same idea with that. You want to say anything? Yes, uh, it's not science, but I grew up on the East Coast. My children live there now, so I'll tell you my age, 83, and in that number of years of living on the East Coast and visiting and going to the beach every day almost as a child, I can assure you red tide, if present then, is certainly worse and heavier now. Uh, I also noticed on the map you had that some of those red tides on the east coast occurred a lot near inlets and areas of discharge. The dots on the map, Sebastian, Fort Pierce, the Canaveral area, down in Miami. So if the input is not affecting these blooms, why is it occurring where there is so much discharge? So I think we have to look at it for the east coast of Florida in the reverse. Uh, red tide being a marine organism, it's being carried around the Florida Keys in the Gulf Current. It's getting into, it's getting through the inlets from the ocean, not the other way around. And so it could be supplemented and growing and maintained by those land-based nutrients that are coming off, but it's coming from the ocean through the inlets, and that's how it's getting to our nearshore environment. Does that make sense? Not exactly. You're saying that the <coughs> tide brings it in and yes. it pushes it back. That's out. exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, because it's carried in the salt water, not in the fresh water. So 
it's coming into our near shore, like in the Indian River Lagoon or Lake Worth Lagoon regions. It's coming near shore with the tide from that salt water so environment. Nutrient, all the nutrients from the septic tanks and stormwater runoff in the Indian River Lagoon and the sewage spills, I might add, discharging or adding nothing to those algae. I'm not saying that. Once it's near shore, the red tide can okay. definitely use those nutrients to feed. And that's what Absolutely. The that, as well. So that is a source of nutrients that they can use to feed, but it's not fuel. It's not creating the red tide. And, and that was what the the no, no, Dr. I, I Hiles. Not okay. Creating. I was talking about yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Here's something I'd like to do. I we're running out of time, and we have some amazing questions on the screen. Many of them have been answered. Um, but some of them are kind of related to one another, such as, you know, why aren't we doing more on prevention, monitoring, and um, we have we have Tom Frazier in the audience, and I'm sorry to put you I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Tom, but I think this is a really cool opportunity. I don't know if you all know that Governor DeSantis has named Dr. Frazier the chief science advisor for the state of Florida. And part of his job is supposed to be very much focused on water quality. Um, and so it might be a nice opportunity for us to kind of ask you, it's the last week of the legislative session. You've started watching some of this. You've been advising Governor DeSantis. Could you kind of address some of those questions that are about you know, sort of what is the state doing and kind of that big picture, your big picture that you're so good at? You feel comfortable with that? Okay, well, let's see. Try this one. Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to say this. I'm going to preface my answers to the question by saying I'm going to um, give them as a scientist at the University of Florida as a marine ecologist who um, works a lot on uh, environmental issues having to do with water quality. And I would agree with our panelists, right? I think that we have a tremendous amount of, or a large number of environmental issues in the state. And I think that the agencies, uh, whether they're the Department of Environmental Protection, the FWC, the Department of Health, all recognize the magnitude of the issues that we're dealing with. And I think that the governor has committed a large number of resources to try to address the challenges because it's in our best interest to do so. So as part of my position moving forward, um, I feel that I'm certainly committed right, to making sure that the, the science that takes place here at the University of Florida and other universities is inserted into the policy and management arena so we can do the best for the citizens of the state of Florida. Tom, thank you. And I, I apologize for putting you on the spot, but seeing you up there and seeing those questions roll along, it seemed like a really good opportunity to hear from you. So congratulations on your big promotion. Thank you. That was it. So um, I. I, th I know that Bruce wants me to bring everything to a close, and so I, I feel like there's still great questions on the screen and probably questions in the audience, and maybe that's the important reason for being for the Thompson in Institute, right? Uh, that you'll be, you'll be tackling all this. I just wanna, I wanna end um, by saying something that, that Jack Davis wrote about in his wonderful Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Gulf, you know, he talks about all of these examples of red tides in history, but also the confusion between red tides and blue-green algae. And he comes, you know, he talks about all the times that journalists get these things wrong and kind of mesh these species together and the various communications challenges that we have. And it really is a big part. It really is a big part of the challenge. So. Um, Jack, Jack had the statement, when you call what happened in Florida last summer red tide, you blame nature and let humans off the hook. So I think he worries even about the term itself. And maybe as we go forward and continue to you know, have, 
have meetings like this and as you go about your important work, maybe we should even think about calling it Red Tide and the language that we use to talk about these different um, organisms and the, and the impacts on this beautiful state and world. So thank you for um, asking us to participate. It was an honor. Thanks. Thank you, Cynthia, and to the panelists for your, your insight and wisdom and answering our questions. We encourage you to fill out our survey listed above, uh, the, web, the, web, the URL up there. We have this room till 4.30. There's cookie, cookies and refreshments outside if you want to stay and mingle. But we'll end, we'll end and close this, this panel right now. And thank you all. I want to um, also hope that we, excuse me, that you'll find ways to engage with our institute so that we can help you to better communicate your science for the benefit of society. Thanks very much and have a nice weekend. <laughs>